questions for the Minister of Social Development, and uh, I can't promise you a round of applause. <laughs> but I call Mr. John McAllister. I call Mr. John McAllister. Oh, let's move on. <laughs> Just because we need the extra time, I'm going to give you that amount of grace. Pay attention, please. John McAllister. Uh, question number one. Thank you. Uh, speaker, and thank you, John, for uh, eventually getting to question number <coughs> one. The current housing selection scheme has been in place since 2000. A consultation published in 2011 by the Housing Executive suggested four changes to the scheme. My predecessor took the view that a more fundamental review of the scheme was required and that this has been taken forward by my department. In close discussion with the Housing Executive and the Northern Ireland Federation of Housing Associations, it is clear from this review that there is strong support for many aspects of the current scheme. However, it is also clear that after 15 years in operation, the scheme may benefit from some changes to make it operationally more effective. Independent research was commissioned by my department to consider the operation of the scheme in Northern Ireland, examples of good practice elsewhere and recommendations for change. This research was uh, made available uh, with a number of recommendations which would significantly alter the current scheme. The research was published by my department for discussion in 2013, and the last year I published a summary of the responses. I'm of the view that changes are needed to the current scheme to ensure that those in the greatest object need are prioritised, and to ensure that the common waiting list operates smoothly and effectively, to enable those who are in the greatest housing need to access accommodation. I am continuing to give my consideration to the proposals for change as a development to ensure that any proposals are supported by evidence of need uh, and of benefits of change to the scheme. My officials are also working with the Housing Executive to consider the evidence available, and any proposals will be presented to the Social Development Committee as soon as possible. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Sorry for being momentarily distracted. Um, the, uh, I welcome the Minister's reply that, that he is looking at, and he will know that I have raised it with him in, in, in private as well. That issue around when family circumstances change, should we move to a model more like um, the rest of the country, that that would be reviewed? Uh, after a set period of time, I think in, in other parts of the country it's after seven years, but should we look and give serious consideration to a model that would look, not seek necessarily to remove um, people from social houses, but to look as if circumstances change, if that's the most appropriate uh, model and, uh, and housing allocation, given the stresses on it? I thank the member, and I thank the member for the interest he takes in this particular issue, because and I think for all members in this House, it uh, is an issue which we have to deal with day and daily in our constituency offices uh, in terms of those people who are seeking to find uh, appropriate accommodation, in some cases accommodation. But uh, I think the question is always well asked, will housing need continue to feature in the allocation process? And I think that's a fundamental question that we need answered. And, and there are no proposals at this minute in time to move away from prioritising housing need. The research found the strong and continued support for prioritisation of applications and allocations of accommodation primarily on the basis of housing need. And stakeholders agreed that there was uh, and needed to be a continual debate around how well the current system captures objective housing need. And I think that, that uh, the, the work that we have done to date, the recommendations uh, that we are considering, is all part of how we can come to an agreed position. And I say that for this reason. I am concerned that this becomes another issue which is very divisive. There is nothing more sensitive and there is nothing that could easily be used by others for all the wrong reasons to generate uh, opposition and generate uh, strife 
around an issue which there should be a general broad acceptance, and that is ensuring that we meet the needs of people who are currently in need of priority housing. I thank the Minister for, for his answer and his sincerity in appreciating just how important uh, social housing is. Given that housing associations have been with us now for more than 20 years and are a mixed bag, some of them good and some of them coming before the Public Accounts Committee for all the wrong reasons, would the Minister in the future be of a mind to consider giving responsibility to the housing executive to provide some social housing? Well, I think that uh, the journey that I have been on uh, for the last number uh, of months in relation to uh, housing has been one where I have endeavoured to try and work with all the providers that we have in relation to housing. Housing is a very complex uh, issue. It's not just solely down to one organisation. And I appreciate the work, uh, and, and there are times we have differences, both with the housing uh, executive and with housing associations. But let's remember that in terms of other providers, whether it's co-ownership or the private sector, we need, and I said this uh, recently at the uh, Association of, Feder uh, of Housing Associations Federation's annual conference, that I want to work continually and collectively with all the housing providers uh, to give the best outcome. And what's the best outcome? to continue to provide good quality homes. And the point that the member uh, makes is something which should be given consideration to. Uh, but he will also have to uh, appreciate that I'm trying to move a number of organisations at uh, different paces and at different times. But I've always rehearsed that the one objective for them all collectively is keep the focus on delivery of good quality homes because the one thing that will transform and change our society and I think we have many examples of it in Northern Ireland is when we deliver for our communities and for our people those very things and that is good quality housing. Thank you and I call Mr Adrian Cochrane Watson. Mr Speaker, uh, would the Minister acknowledge that under the current points system there is a distinct group, namely our, our armed, armed forces. When they are returning to Civvy Street, they are not getting the necessary priority in housing and indeed support that they deserve. I thank the member for his question. Under the current housing selection scheme, priority is awarded on the basis of objective housing need, as we have said. Uh, points will be awarded where the applicant or a member of the applicant's household is returning to civilian life at the end of their service in armed forces and no suitable alternative accommodation is available or the applicant could not reasonably be expected to seek such accommodation. Points will also be awarded where the applicant or a member of the applicant's household is the widow or civil partner of a recently deceased serviceman or woman who is no longer eligible for uh, married or other service quarters and no suitable alternative accommodation is available or the applicant could not reasonably be expected to seek such accommodation. I have no plans at this stage to increase the number of points awarded uh, to people who have left the armed forces. But the Armed Forces Covenant proposes that members of the Armed Forces community should have the same access to benefits and social housing as many other citizens and should not be disadvantaged by the requirement for mobility whilst in service. And my department's policies, I trust, accurately reflect that aspiration. Speaker, the Minister uh, quite rightly uh, pointed out that how this issue can uh, be divisive and one would hope that uh, all efforts would be made to prevent that. Uh, could he say that have we reached a position uh, in order to increase understanding regarding housing provision that perhaps we might uh, need to redefine uh, what he calls the need these days? And I think in response to the member that that is what I was trying to say in, in terms of the consultation that was published back in 2011 uh, and at that stage the housing executive uh, had suggested uh, four changes to the scheme uh, and then we brought forward or my predecessor brought forward the fundamental review of the scheme. I don't think any of these things ever stay static. 
And of course, uh, you know, it's easy to come to this House and to refer to reviews and strategies and, and all of that, but the reality for us all is how we respond to this and how the response is given to our constituents and to the members constituents who come to him on this particular issue but i can assure the member that we are giving serious consideration as to how we can make improvements where those improvements can be made in a way which benefits and is in the best interest of people seeking good quality homes thank you and I call Mr. Peter. I'm sorry. Before, just ask Peter. Uh, can I inform members that question eight has been withdrawn within the appropriate uh, protocols? And Peter Weir. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question number two. Uh, thank you, member, for his question. My department stepped in, uh, taking forward uh, a major comprehensive development scheme uh, in Bangor Town Centre. Uh, this long-awaited and much-anticipated scheme will transform the town centre, bringing many new jobs, uh, homes, shops, offices, and it will act as a major attraction for visitors. Uh, there is widespread support for my department's actions, and officials regularly meet with the statutory bodies, uh, elected members, local businesses, and the community representatives to keep them informed about the process. My officials, in partnership with Council, uh, are on target to appoint a private sector developer uh, who will be responsible for constructing the scheme in September 2016. The estimated cost of the scheme is 60 million and it will be uh, financed by uh, the private sector. In March of this year, my department attained planning approval for a scheme that will provide in excess of 25,000 square meters of floor space. The new development includes uh, residential, retail, commercial and ho hotel accommodation, restaurants, cafes, a courtyard plaza and public open space on uh, marine gardens. The proposal put forward will complement the public realm works which are nearing completion and restore the area into an attractive, vibrant, inclusive place for everyone to enjoy and enhance the reputation of the town as a key tourist and shopping destination in Northern Ireland. So Peter Weir for Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and can I welcome the response of the Minister and also the work that has been ongoing between his department and local stakeholders, particularly the, the local council. And I can ask him for what he believes to be the anticipated timescale for the start of the project. Uh, I thank the member, and I concur with the member in relation to the benefit that this will bring to uh, Bangor and to uh, a place that we all uh, enjoy visiting and have many happy memories uh, of being in that seaside town. And I trust that these works will make a huge contribution uh, to that experience for many others. The granting of the planning permission was a key step uh, in the development of this process. My department, in conjunction with the council, at this stage, I want also to pay tribute to the council not only to their financial contribution, but also to the work that they have done in working with my department. We're working closely with them, and we hope to appoint a private sector development partner in September 2016 uh, to take forward the proposals. And it's estimated that groundworks will commence around 12 to 18 months after the appointment of the developer. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his response. I wonder, Minister, could you confirm to the House if all of the property has been acquired at this stage, and will, in fact, there be a development brief as we used to know it? I uh, thank the member for his question, and I can inform the member that the majority of the property is now in the ownership of uh, my department. My officials have been negotiating with the three remaining property owners for a number of months to achieve uh, agreement by mutual consent. Uh, negotiations are ongoing, however, it is unlikely that agreement will be reached for all the properties and the department has issued notices of intention to vest uh, to the remaining property owners. My department also requested a public inquiry into this decision to adopt a development scheme for Queen's Parade and the issue of vesting notices and this is set for uh, February of 2016. A final decision on making an enacting of the vesting order will be made following the public inquiry. Thank you. And I call Mr. Paul Given. Question number three, Mr. Speaker. Thank the member for his question. Uh, I, intend, I attended the launch event for the newly completed uh, Lisbon Public Realm scheme earlier this month. 
and was impressed with the transformation brought about within the city centre and especially the event space in Market Square. And I thank the member and his colleagues for uh, the hospitality that they showed me on that occasion when we came uh, bearing good news to Lisburn City Centre. The Lisburn Public Realm Scheme was designed to create a world-class space with unique and interesting features introduced to showcase the retail offering within the city and to help improve the pedestrian experience by reducing the dominance of the car in the city streets. The transformed environment will be a great driver for investment, tourism and economic uh, prosperity. The poor quality environment in a number of these streets within the city centre has become even more apparent following the recent public rail improvements, demonstrating that there is a potential need for further intervention. And currently, my department, uh, in conjunction with the Council, are exploring this potential and considering a Lisburn linkage project, which would see public realm improvement works to the streets which link the Market Square and the Bow Street area. Naturally, this project will be subject to the necessary positive economic appraisal and to the availability of future finance. But looking beyond Lisburn in the Lagan Valley constituency, I hope to be able to shortly announce the appointment of a consultancy team to deliver a transportation assessment for the Moore Town Centre. And my department will continue to work uh, with the Council uh, and uh, its officers to identify suitable projects that could be taken forward within the main urban towns in the members' constituency. Can I thank the Minister for that response? And he, he should know that he is always welcome in uh, Lagan Valley, especially when he brings the departmental uh, checkbook, which we hope that uh, is opened again in due course. Uh, we, we too in Lagan Valley hope that the public realm scheme will act as the stimulus. Uh, and already there are new um, shops opening, uh, and uh, we trust that that will continue to be the case. The Minister will be familiar with the Lagan Bank Quarter Development, uh, a project that the Council has developed a master plan for. Is this a scheme that the Department uh, would be able to come on board with and support? Thank the Member, and I concur with the Member's comments. I think that uh, in, in terms of the way in which these schemes and projects are delivered. It is vitally important that we have a working relationship with the local council, and I think we have seen delivery in terms of what has been achieved in this particular scheme. He makes reference then to the uh, Ligon Bank Quarter development, and one of the key development projects identified in the Lisburn Master Plan was the Ligon Bank Quarter development scheme. And my department considers the development scheme to be in the public interest in order to achieve the proper planning of the area and as an impetus to the revitalization of Lisburn city centre as a whole. It was on this basis that the notice of intention to adopt the development scheme in the Lagenbank quarter area of Lisburn was published in the local press during the last two weeks of February uh, 2015. 28-day objection period that followed attracted uh, one representation and my department in conjunction with the Lisburn and Castlereagh City Council now intends to appoint a consultancy team to support the bringing forward of a high quality regeneration scheme on the proposed sites in the Lagenbank quarter area of the city of Lisburn. Again, I'll Mr. Jim Alistair. Mr. What lessons were learned from the uh, Lisburn scheme? which was quite notorious in terms of its delays, etc. My reason for asking that is that judging by the volumes of complaints I'm now receiving about the scheme in Balamina, there seems to have been a dearth of lessons learned in that delays uh, uh, and huge inconvenience seems to be the order of the day. Uh, thank the member for his question. Uh, I, like, I trust him try to learn from lessons and uh, the revitalization schemes, the public realm works, you always learn from them. And given the fact that there was some connectivity between uh, those involved in one scheme and the other, and he makes reference to our own constituency in uh, North Antrim in particular to Balamina, uh, that is an ongoing uh, uh, situation. And uh, as he will probably know, 
uh, that that work has now uh, ceased for the Christmas period as, as the agreement and will recommence on, on the 6th of January, I think the date is. But in these schemes, whether they be in Lisbon, whether they be in Ballymena, whether they be in any other part of Northern Ireland, you can always learn lessons. And maybe that's a lesson the member uh, who asked the question should take on heart. Thank you. And I call Ms. Karen McEvitt. Uh, Mr. Speaker, question four. Thank the member for uh, her question. The Affordable Warrant Scheme is a new and innovative approach to tackling fuel poverty in Northern Ireland. And the scheme is delivered in partnership with the 11 local councils and Northern Ireland Housing Executive. All 11 councils have shown full commitment to the new scheme. And as well as assessing homes for the affordable warmth, they have been able to introduce other council services such as the home safety checks. The affordable warmth scheme's focus is on helping those in the most severe fuel poverty by tar targeting them directly and installing measures to increase energy efficiencies in their homes. This approach has been endorsed by leading fuel poverty experts both in academia and lobbying organisations. The targeted nature of the Affordable Warm Scheme means that there is no need to take any additional measures to maximise uh, take-up as local councils have extensive lists of potentially eligible homes to visit. Almost £9 million in affordable warmth grants have been approved to improve the energy efficiency of homes in the most severe fuel poverty. These homes are receiving cavity and loft insulation, new and improved heating systems and even replacement windows if needed. My department has recognised that it is taking longer than anticipated to process applications and the Housing Executive is carrying out an urgent review of the process aimed at streamlining it whilst maintaining financial and eligibility assurance levels. Some changes have already been made which will speed up this particular process. My department will also carry out a comprehensive end-of-year review to examine performance to date, scheme qualifying conditions, process effectiveness and delivery arrangements, including the potential for easier access to installers. Thank you. And Ms McEvitt for a supplement. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. And, uh, can I thank uh, the Minister for his response? Um, I understand that the 11 councils um, have taken up the commitment uh, to this, but would the Minister have any suggestions uh, to those who maybe haven't taken it up as much um, as others that to be able to improve the delivery um, of this scheme, because it is such a popular scheme in the area, and just trying to get a geographical balance? Thank you. I, I think that uh, we all have a duty, and uh, I would encourage uh, members uh, in their constituency offices but I think that the, the port of call in relation to the local council is a good port of call because we have now been able to secure the involvement and the inclusion and a working relationship with the 11 councils. I want to ensure, because it's a new scheme and obviously when you bring a new scheme into place, there will always be issues that are identified that uh, it really goes back to the, the question that was asked earlier about can we learn any lessons and I think that there are lessons that we are learning as we go through this particular uh, new uh, affordable warm scheme. I had the opportunity some time ago to visit a number of homes that have benefited uh, some uh, in uh, very remote areas because one of the issues that has been raised is uh, how are we particularly addressing the issues in rural areas and I went specifically uh, to visit some of those uh, rural locations and to speak with people in their homes in isolated areas that have been the benefit of a substantial amount of works that have been carried out, whether it be new heating system, loft insulation, and a more holistic approach, rather than just doing one element of uh, work carried out to the, the property, I think has been beneficial. Uh, and I would encourage members and those uh, who they are in contact with in relation to their uh, councils to be in contact with them so that uh, more uh, can be uh, made available in terms of information for people in relation to this particular scheme. Mr. Robin Newton. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I, can I thank the Minister for his answers uh, so far. Maybe the Minister would confirm when the review of the affordable home process 
uh, will be completed and implemented, and what are the expected outcomes of that review? Well, obviously, we are endeavouring to ensure that we learn, and it goes back to the, the, uh, the answer that I gave earlier, that when you look at any scheme, you can always learn from the experience of that particular scheme. I don't want this review to last uh, very long. Uh, I don't want it to be uh, very uh, protracted in terms of the time that it takes. And I trust that as we go through the process in relation to the review, that we will be able to soon identify where we can make uh, useful and valuable changes so that we will, as I said to the previous questioner, enhance this particular scheme and make it one which people actually want to become part of and therefore we can actually increase the number of people who become eligible and not only become eligible but actually take up the particular scheme as uh, it, it was intended to do in the first place. Ken Colia. Uh, Minister, this scheme has indeed been very successful uh, in my own constituency and I want to commend the Council for the work that they are doing uh, with the public in relation to processing the applications for the scheme. But as Mr Newton has, has asked my question, but it is very important uh, to keep this scheme under review to ensure that the most effective delivery is met by those who are most in need. Gormogan. Yes, and I, and I think uh, one of the questions that, that's asked in relation to the view as well, uh, would, would the review of the scheme include the eligibility threshold? Uh, because again, that has been something that has come up. Uh, and all regular household income, including DLA, is included in calculating the householder's income for the affordable warm scheme. The personal independence payment is not currently payable uh, in Northern Ireland, uh, but uh, will soon be uh, when we have the passage of the welfare bill and consideration will have to be given to its treatment when the decision is reached regarding uh, its introduction. However, my department will review the scheme after one full year of operation and we are coming uh, near to that at this moment in time. And this review will include consideration of what is treated as income in order to qualify for the scheme while maintaining a focus on those in the most severe fuel poverty. Because that is what we need to keep as a focus. That is what we need to see as uh, an outcome so that we actually get tangible outcomes. Sometimes I think in, in the past, some of these schemes have been looked upon just as a means of uh, getting something. Uh, but it's, it's what the purpose of getting that is for. And it is to reduce uh, fuel poverty. It is to enhance uh, properties that uh, do have very poor uh, insulation, in some cases no suitable heating arrangement, and as the member knows, in areas like our own constituency, very rural areas that in the past have not benefited as a result of previous schemes. And I think that's why we have endeavoured in this scheme to have a wider reach and that was why we used the thematic approach in terms of the original information that has informed this uh, particular scheme and as we look at the review those things will all again be reconsidered as we give a review to this particular uh, scheme. Thank you and I call Mr Trevor Lund. Uh, question number five Mr Speaker. Uh, thank you uh, Mr Speaker and thank the member for uh, his question on what is uh, a very uh, important issue. And I want to caveat what I want to say now by saying that uh, I would ask that all members in this House give me and my department and the Office of the First and Deputy First Minister every help and assistance in dealing with this particular issue. Because the work on the Vulnerable Persons Relocation Scheme is progressing well. My department uh, is involved uh, in the strategic planning group. Uh, it participates in that, led by the office of OFM-DFM. A senior official from my department leads on the operational planning group, made up of key stakeholders from central and local government and organisations in the voluntary sector that have expertise in supporting refugees. Weekly meetings are taking place where detailed plans are being drawn up for the arrival of the first group of these uh, refugees in Northern Ireland. 
and all agencies involved are content that Northern Ireland will be ready for the arrival of the first group of refugees, which is expected during December. Mr. Lund for supplement. I thank the Minister for his answer. Uh, could I ask him um, what specifically, has there been any discussion with OFM, DFM around the potential community relations problems that may arise? And also, is, is it the intention that these refugees should be clustered, use that word, or more dispersed across Northern Ireland? I thank the member for his uh, supplementary. There has been ongoing discussions uh, between uh, particularly the operational group, which my department is responsible for, and uh, OFM, DFM, with a number of organisations. Because I am very uh, aware of the particular challenges, and, the, and certainly uh, I have to say I have been uh, disgusted by some comments that I have seen recently, uh, particularly in social media, in relation to this issue. Uh, I think that as we come near uh, the time of Christmas, uh, and the message of Christmas is, of course, the coming of the one who is the Prince of Peace and goodwill, uh, and extending that uh, to others, to others who are in circumstances that I have to say uh, none of us can appreciate or comprehend. Uh, and I am determined, and I am working indeed, had further discussions this morning, uh, and will take a very personal interest in this particular issue because I believe that it is incumbent on us as an executive and as a community that we make our contribution to this national scheme and that we keep as a focus that we are dealing here with real people who have real issues and real needs. Thank you. And that ends the period for listed questions and we now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions and I call Ms Karen McKevitt. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, can I ask the Minister, <clears throat> further to the debate on the legislative consent motion on Wednesday passed, can the Minister confirm now what provisions in the 2015 Welfare Reform and Work Bill um, has been agreed in principle between Sinn Féin uh, and yourselves, or at least confirm the details in writing today to my colleague Mr. Atwood um, uh, to honour your commitment uh, during the LCM debate? Uh, I thank the Member for her question. And uh, she is absolutely correct. Uh, her party colleague, whom I have uh, paid a tribute to in this House uh, during the debate and in previous debates, uh, Mr. Atwood did write to me, and I can confirm that I will respond uh, to, indeed, I have a copy of the response uh, in front of me, which I will forward to uh, Mr. Atwood at some stage later on today. Uh, and, the member raises the issue, and I think it is right to do so, uh, in regards to how we move this situation forward. I think that there are some in this House who would like to have, us to have failed, who would like us to have been in a situation where we did not find a resolution to an issue that was causing uh, real concern at the heart of these institutions. And what happened last week in relation to a fair start was uh, a way whereby uh, that new arrangement could be put in place which dealt with this particular problem. And uh, as we uh, see what's happening today in the uh, House of Commons, uh, progress is being made and I look forward to the successful conclusion of uh, the bill uh, in the House of Commons and then getting to the work that has to be done in relation to the implementation. Thank you. And I call Ms McKevitt for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I'm sure the Minister will respect that there is members of this House who are concerned by elements of uh, the deal, uh, particularly around welfare. Um, begin that there is going to be a benefits freeze, which over the next four years inflation uh, will also see reduced monies uh, to the households on benefits. And uh, does this not uh, reduce perhaps significantly uh, the monies in real terms, uh, the top up awarded further to the recommendations by um, Eileen Everson? I think none of us would in any way seek to try and underestimate how difficult uh, this has been and how challenging it is going to be uh, in the future. Uh, and I, uh, I accept the fact that that is one of the reasons why we have had, uh, uh, in part, the impasse over the last number of months. 
But I have come to this House on numerous occasions, and I have given assurance to uh, members who have concerns, including uh, the member's colleague uh, and party, and to others, that one of the issues that I believe was missing in terms of the way in which welfare has been introduced in England in particular was the lack of coordinated uh, implementation, coordinated way in which the policy was implemented. Because I still believe that the policy intent is right, that we ensure that welfare does not become something which people are just subjected to the rest of their lives, that they are imprisoned in a welfare system. There are those who, unfortunately, for certain circumstances, are in a position where it is mostly, it is highly likely that they won't get out of benefit. So we have to ensure that that welfare net is there to protect them. But it should not become a barrier so that people can make further advancement. And what I am determined to do is, uh, in terms of how we roll this out over the next number of months uh, and years, and whoever my successor will be, uh, is done in a way which keeps at the heart of all that we seek to do the people whom this is made for. Is that going to be a challenge? Yes. Is it going to create uh, difficulties along the way? Yes. But I think, as we have proven in the past, if we are presented with those difficulties, if we're presented with those challenges, that we're more than up for addressing those particular problems. Thank you. And I call Ms Claire Sugden. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, first, must I welcome the Minister's announcement at the end of last week for 1.5 million investment in Port Stewart. He's certainly welcome back to East London Derry with an attitude like that. Um, just around the corner in Port Rush, would uh, the Minister give me an update uh, from the ministerial sub? Uh, group on redeveloping of the harbour, re relocation of the train station and identifying a new hotel? Uh, thank you uh, to the member for a question. And it always seems that I am always welcome when I bring money and I'm not as well welcome whenever I come and the coffers uh, are empty. However, uh, in the occasion in relation to Port Stewart last week, I was delighted to be in the member's constituency and to announce uh, a 1.5 million regeneration of uh, Port Stewart promenade and I know that there are some members in this house who spend probably more time on the promenade in Port Stewart than they do in their own constituency. However, uh, and so they will welcome particularly uh, the enhancement of Port Stewart. When we go round to uh, Port Rush, I think that the, there are those uh, who will welcome the fact that the announcement in relation to the Open Championship offers a major opportunity uh, to uh, ensure that there is sustainable development of the tourism product in Port Rush and in the North Coast. Uh, and it's uh, in my intention that a paper will be brought very soon uh, to the executive uh, that will set out the programme of regeneration works for Port Rush. The proposals for its delivery has uh, been issued to uh, my colleagues in the executive. And I want to ensure that uh, Port Rush uh, is in the right place uh, at the right time for taking the advantage of the open. But I want to say this also to the member. It is not just only about Port Rush. It's about the North Coast and it's about Northern Ireland. Because let's remember the huge influx of people that there will be and the interest that there will be in the most prestigious golf tournament that the world knows. For a supplementary. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And the Minister is always welcome to uh, the prom from Morelli's um, at any time. Um, there is speculation that um, around the Dunluce Centre site being a possible location for a hotel. Um, will the Minister confirm if this is an option he is considering? There has been a, a piece of work that has been carried out, which I have just uh, taken possession of, uh, which sets out what potentially the options would be. And the member will be aware that there were some concerns by other hoteliers that uh, there was maybe going to be something that would come to Port Rush that would be in some way uh, a disadvantage to them. I've now uh, been in receipt of that scoping exercise that has been uh, concluded. It does state that uh, Port Rush would be able to accommodate uh, a new four-star hotel and also a boutique hotel. Uh, and what I want to do now is to have uh, conversations with the Council, 
conversations with local uh, representatives and with other hoteliers in the area because uh, I'm equally very conscious that uh, competition is uh, in many cases welcome, however it has to be done in a way which is sensitive and I greatly appreciate uh, the contribution that uh, many in the hotel and restaurant industry have made in recent times to the revitalization of Portrush. Uh, I can remember going back not that many years ago uh, that Portrush was a place where on a Saturday night uh, you wouldn't have felt uh, very comfortable because of uh, just the activities that were done uh, late at night, but I have to say that image and that uh, situation has changed completely, and Portrush now has become a very vibrant local economy, a night economy that is growing, and uh, a key component part of that will be the consideration of a new hotel as set out in the document. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Adrian McQuillan is not in his place. I do understand that his office was in touch, but uh, was too late for the, uh, the, the proper kind of notification. But uh, at least uh, let me acknowledge that uh, the contact was made. I call Mr. Marcino Mueller. Uh, Minister, last week you made an announcement around Royal Exchange. Um, I was in public office in 1985 when it first came on the scene. You were probably a primary school then, Minister, but since then it hasn't made the, pro the progress that we hope for. It in fact has been an albatross around the neck of Belfast in that time. Can you give us a pledge that you will be the minister to really get this project moving? I thank the member for his question. And, and the department did give careful consideration before terminating the Royal Exchange Agreement with the Leaside Investment Limited with our overriding aim to ensure that the northeast quarter of the city, including Royal Exchange, is developed uh, for the maximum economic benefit uh, for everyone. And I remain, and I can give uh, the member this uh, personal commitment uh, in the House today, that I remain committed to transforming this part of the city, which has been yeah, in a state of yeah. disrepair for many years. And I have asked my officials to explore how a statutory development scheme for the area can help establish uh, an appropriate mix of uses. Uh, we will continue to work in partnership with the stakeholders across the statutory community, political and business sectors to make sure we deliver the best scheme possible. And can I also say to the member that that will include uh, the City Council. I have had discussions uh, already with the City Council because uh, as it is with Royal Exchange, as it is with other uh, programmes that the Council uh, has, and you know the Council has set out its own uh, plans for the future. Uh, I think that has to be done in consultation with the Department and the Council and the public representatives for the area, so that we can continue to build on the success which is our uh, capital city and see progress made in a way which deals with areas, as the member rightly identifies, such as road exchange, that need to be addressed. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and, and thanks to the Minister for his answer. Um, I yes, particularly welcome the, the uh, commitment to work in partnership with Belfast City Council, because I've been very heartened uh, by their investment plans uh, to regenerate the city centre. Would the Minister also agree that this does not need to be a retail-led retail uh, development at Royal Exchange, that retail will be a part of it, but also we should factor in the University of Ulster now in the city centre, of course, culture and arts? Yes, I, I would agree, and I think that this is where uh, both the Council and the uh, Department need to be innovative in the way in which we look sometimes at uh, situations. We, we easily get criticised that we never do enough. Uh, and you know, questions have been asked in this house about other locations. Uh, and uh, you know, why do we not do uh, this in a certain way? I, I think that we have to come to a, a sensible conclusion that sometimes uh, we need to identify what is the best for that area and what way it ties in with all the other elements of what's going on around it. The member is absolutely right to make reference to the university that is now located in that area, uh, to not far away the cathedral quarter, and, and all the various elements that, that make up what is a very attractive and has become a very vibrant part of the city. This could add to that, and there's no uh, 
guarantee that we should say that this should only be retail. It has to be a mix in a way which provides for that particular area. Thank you. I call Ms. Katrina Rea. Corlia, and I wonder would the Minister outline what additional resources he intends to provide uh, for the advice sector for the remainder of this mandate? Well, in terms of the advice centre, we, we have endeavoured since coming into office, first of all, to protect as best as we possibly can the budget which the advice sector has had. I value very much uh, the way in which uh, I and my department depends upon the advice sector to give to people uh, advice in an independent way, which is apart from government. And I have, for example, uh, in relation to uh, mortgage advice, uh, we increased their budget by something like 50 per cent because we felt that given the particular challenges that there were to uh, families and to uh, people who were struggling in relation to their mortgage, it was vitally important that early intervention early information was made available to people in relation to uh, advice in the mortgage uh, area. In terms of other advice, uh, the member will be aware, having been a minister uh, herself, that at this particular time of the year, uh, we all start to look at our budgets for next year. We have the comprehensive spending review, which will uh, undoubtedly be uh, made uh, more or will be given more detail in relation to that on Wednesday in the House of Commons, and I have to take into consideration all of those challenges. But I can say this to the member, I value the independent advice sector, I value the work that they do, and we have endeavoured to ensure that that is reflected in the money that we give to them. Sorry, there isn't time for a supplementary, and that uh, brings us to the end of question time. Thank you very much, Minister. Yes, a point of order. Um, I just want to raise a point of order in relation to the previous question time when the junior minister, Ms Pengeli, was uh, answering some questions. She referred to the Office of Office of First Minister and Deputy First Minister just as Office of First Minister. Now, I think this House will be aware no such office exists. It's a joint office, and the, title, the full title of the office is OFM, DFM. Now, I understand it is Ms Pingelli's uh, first question time. Um, having said that, she has worked at some level in that office for a significant period of time, and I wonder would the Speaker uh, make sure that this doesn't happen again. Thank you. Well, uh, the, the member has the, uh, the matter now well and truly on the record, and uh, what we will do is, uh, is observe this situation. I mean, I do think that uh, you know, we are moving, and I believe and hope, that, uh, beyond the point of people just being uh, petty. There is the, uh, the fact of the matter. People know what the proper title of the office is, and it should be adhered to. But uh, in the particular circumstances, I don't feel that there's any need for me to take this matter any further.